Hello, this is Father Louis Skirty with Friends of the Word. I'm here at the beautiful church of Espiritu Santo in Florida. We thank you for joining us today. Today is the 13th Sunday of Ordinary Time, and we like you to join our mail list, and we'll send out the emails once a week. Join me at lskirty at hotmail.com. God bless you. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and he stayed close to the sea. One of the synagogue officials named Jarius came forward. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, saying, My daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her, so that she may get well and live. He went off with them, and a large crowd followed him and pressed upon him. There was a woman afflicted with hemorrhages for twelve years. She had suffered greatly at the hands of many doctors and had spent all that she had. Yet she was not helped, but only grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. She said, If I but touch his clothing, I shall be cured. Immediately, her flow of blood dried up. She felt it in her body. She felt that she was healed of her affliction. Jesus, aware at once that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and asked, Who has touched my clothing? But his disciples said to Jesus, you see the crowd is pressing in upon you, yet you ask who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. The woman, realizing what had happened to her, approached in fear and trembling. She fell down before Jesus and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be cured of your affliction. While he was still speaking, people from the synagogue officials arrived and said, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher any longer? Disregarding the message that was reported, Jesus said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid. Just have faith. He did not allow anyone to accompany him inside the home, except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they arrived at the house of the official, he caught sight of a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. So he went in and said to them, Why this commotion, this weeping? The child is not dead, but asleep. They ridiculed Jesus. Then he put them all out, and he took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and entered the room where the child was. He took the child by hand and said to her, Talithekum in Aramaic, means, Little girl, I say to you, arise. The girl, a, a child of twelve, immediately arose and walked around, and they, they were utterly astonished. Jesus gave orders that no one should know this, and he said that she should be given something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just in case you think the reader of the first reading from the Book of Wisdom made a mistake, she did read, God did not make death, nor does he rejoice at the destruction of the living. And yet, we know death is around us. We know old people, young people, accidents kill people. Young people, old people die daily. What does it mean, God did not make death. Book of Wisdom. Book of Wisdom was a, a, a body of literature that was written during the period around 60 years before Jesus comes on the scene. It was written by a group of Jews who, through the diaspora, which is the spreading out of Judaism throughout the, the, from the Palestine area, landed up in Alexandria, the, the, the area of Greek philosophy, okay? And the people of the Greek model of, of believing and understanding 
not being people of the scriptures, figured, if I can figure it out, I understand it. Their, their word, philosophy, comes from the Greek concept, the love of wisdom. So if I could figure it out, I understand it. And there was a movement at that time, and the Jews were concerned that their young people, maybe it's 2012 all over, I don't know, but the young people were influenced by the world. And, and the world supplied answers that it seemed not even the gods, don't forget from the Greek perspective, the gods could give us. So the Jews, who were faithful people of the covenant, who held on to their relationship with Yahweh, were concerned that their children were being misguided by what this philosophy says, or that philosophy says, or this feel-good philosophy, or that feel-good philosophy. Or think of what, what's popular today, what, what draws attention today. Jesus certainly doesn't. The gospel certainly doesn't. Scandal does. People making mistakes, number one. Death and destruction, right in the front page. So, it seems that even today, the scriptures give us a little challenge. Now, wait a minute. If God didn't create death and, and the world is in such a state, maybe the scriptures are mistaken? No. Because the life that the scriptures are talking about is a life of a simple word that we see enveloping the, the gospel today, a simple word that, that puts light into, into our situation, that enlightens us, illuminates us, and makes us understand what it's all about. And that simple word is faith. The person with faith and using and living that faith in God, the Eternal One, does not die. His or her soul does not die. It is not condemned to the darkness of sin and eternal damnation. Our goal, and, and we, by the way, we have proof of that goal, our goal is to live. The Holy Cross shows us what Jesus felt about death. He embraced it because it's part of the human condition, but it wasn't going to hold him still. It wasn't going to hold him dead, condemned to the netherworld, whatever you want to call that. The Holy Father, His Father, our Father, God, the Creator, brings Jesus back to life to show us what that means in the Book of Wisdom. God creates life. Death comes through the circumstances of physical humanity. And the Book of Wisdom goes one step further and says, you know what? God even created people to be imperishable, to have their eternal soul go on. In the image of his own nature, God created every one of us. Get this one. But by the envy of the devil, death has entered the world. So when we talk about the pain of disaster and death, we're talking about how even Jesus refers to this world sometimes in the grip of Satan. That's why you and I as Christians are, are in the world, but we're not of the world. But our job is to change the face of the world, to make it more reflective of God's presence in our lives, through our respect for each other, through our love for each other, through our feeding the poor, through our reaching beyond our own little worlds and going beyond to help one another, to, to create on earth the image of God that in which each of us are made. So let's fast forward to Mark. And how does Mark share his version of the inside of this, this holy book from wisdom. Mark looks at Jesus as a teacher. Read the whole Gospel of Mark. Jesus is always being referred, one way or the other, as the teacher. Even, even Jairus' servant comes to him and says, why bother the teacher anymore? Your kid's dead. Jesus, Jesus you know, pushes that aside. But what's the whole story? It, it, it's, it's adorable. It, it's a great story. I think it shows Jesus trying to get us, at 2,000 years ago, we still haven't caught on, by the way, trying to get us to really respect humanity, to respect one another. Jesus came to bring in flesh God's life to us. And through his life and his teaching, wants us to return to the Father. 
but together with our sisters and brothers of faith. So Jesus is preaching, and this woman who has hemorrhage for 12 years with no, no, no cure in sight, she brings something to the relationship between her and this itinerant preacher. And she says to herself, if I just but touch his garment, I'll be healed. And she does. It was probably either his cloak or maybe his prayer shawl. As a good Jew, he would have worn one. But she just touches the hem of his garment and her flow of hemorrhage dries up. And she's, she's trembling. She's, she's astounded. Now, Jesus is crowded, and, and, and Mark makes it very clear. Jesus is surrounded by people on all sides, and, you know, nudging him, nudging him. Come on, let's go see what else he's going to do. And he turns around and says, who touched me? Now, could you imagine being with Jesus? And imagine all of us going for donuts at, like, the morning mass. They all go for donuts. All of us in the donuts, and, and somebody saying, who touched me? Who touched you? There's people at your elbows, your back, your front. Everybody. What do you mean, who touched you, Jesus? But he knew. That touch was the, the chemistry of that poor woman and the faith that she had in Jesus that's being shared with us today. She touched Jesus in faith. The same faith that we've been gifted with. The same gift, uh, gift of faith that we've been blessed with. But we've got to use it. Hold on. So, Jesus looks at her. And wow, and every, I think every woman in Christianity, should have this gospel blown up and framed. Because it shows Jesus, first of all, dignifying... You've got to figure... You've got to know the, the, the situation. A woman, not married, she's a loner. She's got a hemorrhage, so she's ill. And in the Old Testament version, Jesus, don't forget, Jesus is bringing in the New Testament, but he's still working out of an Old Testament model. If you were a woman and you're unmarried or, or you're a widow... You're a piece of trash. You, you, you have to beg. They, they became beggars. If you're a woman with an illness, or even a man with an illness, you were shunned. You were outside the group. You, you didn't come into the temple. People didn't go near you. So this leftover of society, this remnant of society, has the audacity, we call it faith, to touch Jesus with faith. He dignifies her. We don't know her name, but you, you, you will know her until Jesus returns in glory. You will know her because he calls her his daughter. He raises that woman up. Think sociologically, think spiritually. He raises her up. She's no longer a, a remnant of society. She's no longer a leftover. She's no longer someone to be shunned. She's a daughter of God. And he says, your faith has made you whole. Your faith has healed you. Mark uses a very interesting word. It's in, in Aramaic, it's called sozo. S-O-Z-O. And that word, sozo, means healed and saved. Her faith has healed her. Her faith has saved her. See, it wasn't Jesus going, zap, I'm going to make you I'm gonna make you whole, zap, I'm going to fix you. It was the faith coming from that woman, and this is for us, to, to really latch on to, the faith coming from us, going to Jesus, that heals us. And Jesus had heard about Jairus, his daughter, and Jairus is a synagogue official. He's part of the establishment. He's no fan of Jesus, but he brings something, even in, in, in his darkness, the darkness of his not knowing, not following Jesus yet, he goes to Jesus and says, I, I want you to come to my house just to touch my daughter. For us as Catholics or Westerners, it's as if we're asking Jesus to go in the middle of Afghanistan and touch the hand of a Muslim girl who is ill. The, the, what Jesus does to society is aggravating. He turns it upside down. Because the kid in Afghanistan and the kid who's Jairus' daughter are the, made in the same image of God that you and I are. And what do they do? Don't worry, she's not sleeping. She just wants to go to the house. This guy's nuts. They say they ridicule him. This guy's nuts. Okay. We know the family. The kid's dead. She's out. You just push them out. She's asleep. And then he touches her. 
Talete kum. Get up, little girl. Jesus operating on the relationship of faith through Jairus and Jairus' wife, wife, operating on that level of faith, giving life to the sick girl once again, a female. This morning at the children's mass, I had all the kids here, as they normally do for the children's mass. Most of them happened to be girls. I said, all the girls stand up. And I said, one of them had the shawls that they wear as, as uh, ministers of welcome. I said, give me that shawl. She gave me the shawl. I see this rag. That's all it is. It's a rag. In the time of Jesus, you girls weren't worth any more than this rag. And that's not a lie. That's not a lie. And when those girls grew up, if they were widows, they were beggars. Nobody wanted them. That's why the law of Moses said, you've got to marry your, your dead brother's wife. Because if you don't marry her, she's out in the trash. She's out begging for her, her, her kids and herself. What does Jesus do? He dignifies the role of women in this beautiful gospel of healing. He raises the role of women in our society to, to a level that is equal to himself. My daughter, get up. My child, get up. The life of God is there in him and the life of God is given to this child. And yes, the child probably, not probably, eventually died again. And so did Lazarus in the tomb die again. But the power that this God, Jesus, man, brings us is the power that inspired us. I was talking to someone earlier today. Inspired, for instance, throughout our country, throughout the world, the greatest charitable organization in the world is Catholic Charities. Throughout the world, there's a flood, they're there. There's a hurricane, they're there. There's a tsunami, they're there. You have a very active Catholic charities here in Pinellas County. I know, I was talking to someone just coincidentally today. She was talking about the, the soup kitchen and how they cook here, and then they bring it to, to I think it's uh, Project Hope, whatever they call it, and it, it's all through Catholic charities. And she was going nonchalantly, nonchalantly continuing the ministry of Jesus Christ in this parish, and in parishes throughout the world. Yes, the book of wisdom is accurate. God doesn't encourage death. He encourages us to live and encourage one another to live. By respecting the role of women and men in society. By respecting the role of the ill in society. How many of us shun somebody like a wheelchair, somebody who, who may be dribbling, someone who looks different, who speaks differently? We shun them. What is Jesus going? He goes right to them. Right to the woman with hemorrhage. Right to the child who, quote, was sleeping or dead. He doesn't shun. Our... Catholic healthcare system certainly gets its inspiration from this kind of a gospel. But our sociology has to get inspiration. Our Catholic sociology has to get inspiration. When we look at the number of abortions throughout the world, the higher percentage of chosen abortions are females. People who selectively choose. And that's not here in the United States only. That's statistics throughout the world. So the role of women I just noticed in your news here in, in Florida. It's one of the new aspects of the laws being signed in, many laws being signed in today here in Florida. And one of them is sexual trafficking, the higher penalty. And who, who are those victims? Girls and women, mostly. Throughout the world and even on our own borders. So we haven't caught on yet to the Holy Gospel. We as Catholics have the obligation through our vote, through our prayer, through our action, through our social networking to speak up for the healthcare system, speak up for the rights of women and children and little girls and little boys. We have the obligation based on Jesus in whose image we are made. The Book of Wisdom. God formed you to be imperishable and the image of his own nature he made you. Hey, me? That's the Holy Gospel. Excuse me, the Holy Scriptures from the Book of Wisdom. And Jesus gives life to those words by putting spiritual and even physical life back 
where it looked like it was dead and healing back where it looks like it was hopeless. What's your job now? What's our job? We come, we receive the body of Christ. Please don't leave it here. Please don't say amen, go in peace, and forget about Jesus until next week, same time, same station. This goes with us because it's not written only in paper. This is written on our hearts. From the moment we were baptized, these are our words. You and I were created to be imperishable and so was the person next to you and so was the person downtown St. Petersburg and so was the person just caught in the flood and our job is to continue that imperishability, the spiritual life that we've been given by rolling up our sleeves and doing what Jesus does, heal one another.